But the point is, is you can have your gun taken away from you and it can be used against you. And it might be easier to do when you're open carrying because they know about it. They can plan. They can decide the moment they want to jump you. When your back is turned, when you're distracted, they can come up behind you, take your gun out, and lo and behold, now you don't have a gun. That's another reason that I waited so long to do this video because there are some distinct disadvantages with open carrying. That is, in my opinion, number one on the list, that you can get disarmed. There are ways to mitigate this. You can get uh, higher retention levels in your holsters, just like hopefully a lot of cops have. Uh, I don't know, level two, level three, level four. So it takes a certain procedure to extract the gun. That's probably a good thing. It's something I don't have with these shoulder holsters. So admittedly, it's pretty easy to get this gun. It's really fast to the draw. I can get the gun out, but it's also easier for people to take it away from you. Study retention techniques. There's a lot of information out there. there no doubt there's a ton of YouTube videos of people who may or may not know what they're talking about, but hopefully you choose a good one. You know, I kind of was worried when I hooked up with you again, you would have put on like 50 pounds or something, but dude, I'm, you're staying in shape. I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm getting older and you got to try a little bit harder as the uh, years goes by, go by. So hanging out in places like, like gyms like this. So trying to stave off the effects of age. You're looking good, dude. Thank you. Looking good, looking fit. Here's <laughs> Officer Jared back in the Nut and Fancy back project. Yeah, one, of the, one of the old school uh, Nut and Fancy uh, characters and I'm, I'm back <laughs> here with you again. Yes, and here's his friend, Enos. How you doing, buddy? Good, how you doing? So he's a sparring partner. Both of these guys have been on camera before. They are excellent, excellent. Uh, they are both badasses. I think you have certificates hanging on your walls at home, right? That say you're badasses? Uh, yeah. That's exactly what I have. Among other that. things. Yes. Uh, what we're going to do, though, is show you how to retain your pistol in your holster. I did an open carry video. Part of that was providing instruction to you guys, maybe a refresher if you know some of these techniques or stuff before. And we're going to use these two gentlemen to teach you. And we're going to try to keep it simple and useful for you, the viewer, you, the tmp -er, so that you can retain your gun if and when you decide to carry openly. We're going to discuss that here in a minute, but it also applies to concealed carry. Maybe you have a shirt over your pistol holster and someone makes you. There's a lot of different scenarios where someone can uh, see that you have a gun and they want that gun. Yep. They want that gun. So it happens all the time. Happens all the time. Happens to officers all yes, the time. Yes. So that's what we're here for. We're gonna go through some scenarios. We're gonna, you're gonna be taught by two experts here. Um, they have a lot of experience in all this stuff. They have experience in all types of, well, I shouldn't say all types, but they have a lot of experience in martial arts, grappling, and all that good stuff we've shown before. Yeah. And yeah. so. Yeah, and uh, it, it, when we were police officers together and I was an academy instructor, I would pull Enos into the academy to help me with the grappling programs, the ground fighting programs, because that's his, really his specialty is, uh, is grappling, um, stand-up grappling, ground fighting and whatnot. So, yeah. Nice. Excellent. Uh, before we get going on techniques, let's talk just a second about holsters. And this will dovetail back into my open carry video. Um, if you're going to carry openly, I recommend some type of strong holster with retention. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Yeah. Okay. The, the, your, your last line of defense is your, a good holster. And sometimes your first line of defense, depending on what the scenario is. But if you get knocked unconscious and someone's trying to take your gun to execute you with it, the holster could be the only thing that saves your life at that point. So it's your last line of defense, but it's some, in a surprise type snatch situation, it can also be your first line of defense. So a good holster that's designed specifically for your weapon, not a one size fits all, because those are easy to pull guns out of, and um, something that's got some good retention. And you know, concealment is a level of retention, so if your weapon is concealed and you've just got good friction on there, that might be good enough. But if it's an open carry thing, you definitely want some mechanical retention on that holster. Now, we're not looking at this Serpa as like the end all pistol holster. It, it was just convenient. It has something. Yeah. You have to push a button to get it out. It's just what I had. And so don't look at that and go, oh, yeah. that's the ultimate and retention I, holster. We're not saying that. No, and, and I know that a lot of departments, including most federal agencies, have gone completely away from the Serpa holster because of some function issues that they've found. So it's yeah. just something that we had for this training video. It's yeah. not something we necessarily um, advocate. advocate. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, now, in this scenario, we're gonna consider that 
you've decided to open carry. Do you have any thoughts on that, by the way? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's a time and a place. If I'm, if I, I, I don't recommend, from my perspective, open carry in for just normal civilian walking around town, going to the supermarket type of thing, because you want to maintain elements of surprise. You don't want to be that. And and if I am a am a, a, a robber that's robbing a place that you happen to be in, and I see you with a gun, you're probably the well, not probably you're definitely the first person that I'm going to shoot. You know, if, I, if that's the type of individual that I am. And we see that happen all the time in certain countries where there are a lot more robberies than we have here in the U.S. The person that they make as a police officer or the person that they see that has a gun, that's the first person that gets taken out. So maintaining that element of surprise for me is a big thing. It can be a deterrent, yeah. Um, so there might be a time and a place depending on um, where you live. You know, uh, maybe you live in a more of a rural area where you're not walking through crowds and whatnot. So there's a time and a place, but for general purposes, I'm not a huge advocate of it. So in the video open carry, one of the things I do is I'm, I'm wearing a gun when I run the dog in the neighborhood. So I'm not around people. Exactly, uh, I yeah. do have people driving by and looking, and I told them in the video, to me it's a show of force, go to some other neighborhood. I was, I, There's exactly, times and yeah. places where yes. it makes sense. I was hiking with my family the other, the other day, and I was open carrying because you know we were in bear country, and I just want to be able to access that weapon mm -hmm. quickly if I had to be able to get to it. So this is time and place. Yeah. So there's no blanket statements. We're just saying uh, do what you feel is best, but there are advantages and big disadvantage to pretty much everything you do. And be, maybe be aware of the of the common mo of, of people in the areas that you live. You know, and right. uh, what what robbers do, what's common crimes, and things of that nature. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, let's step over here, gentlemen, and uh, off we go with uh, some ideas yeah. of how to retain your pistol, Jared. Absolutely. So I'm just going to kind of take you guys through some steps. We're not going to spend a ton of time going through a full course that I might teach in like two days. Okay. We're going to go through some, some things that I believe can be life-saving principles and ideas. Okay. Uh, the first one is if you're carrying a firearm, you are responsible to take your situational awareness to another level, okay? And so you need to be constantly in that condition yellow that, you know, that, that Jeff Cooper talks about. Just constantly aware of who's around you. You're kind of living uh, another level of responsibility if you're, if you're armed. And, I, and obviously we're talking about legally armed, um, responsible civilians. You know, not, none of this is applies to illegally carrying firearms. So situational awareness needs to be at another level if you're carrying a firearm. Okay? Um, and, and, the statistics that we know about here in the U.S. Uh, is mostly law enforcement because that's where statistics are mostly kept. We don't have a lot of statistics with regards to civilian situations, but about one in five officers, that, that number fluctuates given, given any, in, in any given year, but about one in, office, one in five officers that are killed by a firearm are killed with their own weapon. Okay? And so um, they've had their weapon taken off them at some point of some altercation and they're being killed with it. So, uh, about 80% of the time that a weapon, an officer is successfully disarmed of his, of his firearm, he's executed with it, okay? So 80% of the time. What that tells you, if someone's trying to take your firearm, their intention is not to see what caliber you like to carry or, or what, what upgrades you have on your gun. Their intentions are bad, okay? They're, trying to, they're actually trying to bring a weapon into an altercation. Okay, uh, and we're talking about, you know, this is, this is under, under bad circumstances that someone's trying to take your weapon. They're trying to bring a weapon into that fight. And so you should be treating that situation as if it's a fight for your life, okay? Because, again, they've demonstrated their intent. Um, and so having said that, you can step your levels of force up to save your life, okay? Or to save lives of people that might, might be around you. So you need to kind of be thinking that along those lines. It's a desperate situation. The mindset needs to be survival. You're fighting for your life um, when you go through these processes. Uh, when I look, look at the actual um, techniques, the first thing that I, I teach people to do if someone's trying to grab at their weapon is, one, secure your weapon. Don't let that, it come out of its holster. Okay? Keep it in your control. And at the same time, you need to be establishing a base, okay? a good solid base, because there's a good chance that, that that may tumble to the ground, in which case you may be at a disadvantage. Okay? So, um, don't, let the, don't let the fight fall to the ground if you can avoid it, so get a good base. So basically, what I have people do is secure the weapon in two ways. Okay, there's two things I like to teach. And it may depend on the type of holster, or you may just practice both and find one works better for you. Okay, so the first one is to kind of hammer down and push in on an angle towards your hip. Not straight down, because some holsters, that's just going to break it right off. So I'm pushing down. So if, if Enos was grabbing onto my holster, I'm basically... Okay, we'll come over here, fellas. Yeah. Against this background, that way you can see everything. Okay, go for it. So if Enos was grabbing onto my holster, onto my gun, the first thing I'm doing, I'm going to ham, kind of heel palm his hand and push it into my holster, okay? Okay, let's take a look at his grip right here, guys. So I'm pushing straight down, 
into my hip, not, sh not down that direction, because that mm -hmm. might break the holster off. I'm just catching here, and then my second hand is actually securing his arm, okay? A couple of other things I'm doing here. You see my, my base just got real wide, okay? A wide base is not good for mobility, but I'm not looking to be mobile right now. I'm looking to be stable, okay? Broader base equals stability. So I'm, I'm, as soon as he's grabbed onto that, I'm controlling that, and I'm getting a good base, and I'm bringing my shoulders up a little bit just to kind of protect my neck. I don't want him to try and choke me or something with his other hand or start punching me in the jaw. So as soon as that happens, I'm protecting myself, I'm controlling, and I'm getting a good, good uh, control of my weapon. The second one I like to teach, which actually I prefer in, some, in many situations, is when he's done, he's grabbed onto that, I control, and then I grab the bottom of the holster and I pull up. Okay, like that. I might be able to get my whole arm up under there. Check okay. that out, I've never seen that one. But as soon as I do that, take the gun out of the holster, okay, it's, it's not going anywhere. Now again, some holsters, this might not work. It may pull off your belt or whatnot, so you just gotta kind of play with it depending on the holster that you have. But I, I secure, I pull up, and then maybe he was able to get his finger into the trigger guard, so I'm just kind of keeping clear of the muzzle right now. If I, was, if I had to keep my hand there, I'm just gonna move that like that. But I can there control ain't no here. Ways getting it out, especially no. if you have a button to push or exactly. retention method exactly. of the holster. So right now it's locked in there. Yeah. Okay. And so that's my first measure. And just get a good base, secure your weapon. Okay? Now, from there, I like to look at priorities of, of what is feasible and what might work. And so we've got a number of things. What I've found through running literally thousands of force-on-force um, -force scenarios, mostly in police and military type training events, but I've found that the most successful way to protect one weapon is to transition with your offhand to another weapon. Mm, I like that. So yeah, that, that, that has by far the best, way to, uh, the best way to get someone off your weapon. And what I mean by that is, if this was long gun retention, then I may be securing my long gun and going for my, my sidearm, right? If this is handgun retention, then it's most likely, if I've got another weapon, it's maybe an edged weapon. And so if he's doing that here, and I've protected my weapon now, okay, I may be looking to go for, if you look down here, I have a trainer of a, of a push dagger type knife. So I might be looking to get that and then start looking for targets that are going to get. And, and at the same time, I should be verbalizing because if someone, if there's people around, I want witnesses. Because if I end up stabbing this guy, I need people to hear me saying, let go of my gun, let go of my gun. Good so point. there's no question about what I'm trying to do as I stab this guy. Mm -hmm. So let go of my gun, let go of my gun, okay? And I start hitting targets that I feel are gonna get him to let go of the gun. I may be cutting against his arm to try and break his grip and then breaking distance and moving as far as I can and giving commands as I draw my weapon and keeping him at gunpoint. So the whole time, and this is a training thing because you'll, you'll fight the way that you're trained, right? That everyone knows right. the adage. So, um, let go of my gun, let go of my gun, let go of my gun. Put those verbal commands into your actual training repetitions, and that way you'll do it when it's time to protect your weapon. Okay? So, um, so if, I, if I can transition to a, 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 a knife or of some kind, and this is a big argument, if I do carry a firearm for carrying a knife that's accessible with your support side hand, because okay. um, that's going that's to... That's a great point. Yeah, because if, if I'm protecting Because my if arm, you've got a folder clipped here, now what? Exactly. It's I, locked up. You no. can't do that. Exactly. And that's what I do frequently. So, so yeah, if, it's, if you're carrying a firearm... Now, if I wasn't carrying a firearm, I traveled around the world a lot, and I teach different countries where I can't have a firearm. I put my primary weapon, which is now my knife, on my dominant side. But if I'm carrying a firearm, if I want it accessible at a minimum to my support side, maybe with both hands, because even this, where I've got this, if I had to get it with my strong hand, right. I can still get it with my strong hand. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's, you know, uh, ideally you can access it with both hands, but at a minimum your support hand if you're carrying a firearm. So that's kind of, uh, um, you know, the process there. So if, th that may not be feasible if you don't have another weapon on you, but if that is uh, an option, statistically that's going to be your best chance of getting someone off your gun. Okay, when they're going for your gun, I think the audience is going to understand at this point they're trying to kill you. Correct. You, you really can't assume anything else. Right. If, and you mentioned earlier um, they're trying to interject a weapon into the confrontation. Yes. 
if your gun is holstered up, no weapon has been introduced. Is that a true statement? Um, uh, like you haven't drawn your weapon, you're not pointed at anybody. Correct. Yeah, if, if the weapon is holstered, you know, and uh, and again, I then it may if I had at some point of that altercation. Um, threatened use of force, then maybe it has been introduced to some level. Um, okay. But if it's just there and I haven't threatened to use it, then yeah, it has not been introduced. Legally, it hasn't been introduced in the fight. Uh, a lot of states like Utah, I can, if the, to avoid an altercation, I can advise an individual that I am armed and that I don't want if I'm in the attempt to, dis, to, to, to uh, disengage from a situation. Um, some states you can't do that. It's just it's a fine line between doing that and brandishing, okay? Um, mm -hmm. and so you just gotta understand your local laws. That's right, and this isn't legal advice. Again, every state's different, every locale's different. Exactly. That's up to you to apply to that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so now, looking at that, let's just say I didn't have another weapon to transition, and it may not be a knife. I may have had a tactical pen in my pocket or something, I can just start Coubertin. something like that, and I just start smashing in the face with that, because this is the other thing we're gonna get at. If I, what, one thing that's going to happen is if someone is, is focused on my firearm, a lot of times they leave some high value targets exposed, i.e. the head and the neck, right? So if he was grabbing here, one of the first things I might be doing is slamming my head right into his face, okay? Because it's right there. Mm -hmm. right? So just the process of actually getting a good base brings my head down, and that in and of itself may have jammed Where are you hitting him? Using your forehead as your weapon? Yes, and are you going to get jacked up doing that? No. So the hard plate of the forehead right up in this kind of Yours is especially hard too. Isn't yes. It? It's, it's a, um, I'm half Polynesian, so it's half coconut here. So, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I've got, um, so you've got that upper plate of the okay. forehead. Okay. And so long that's as your strike that, weapon. That's your strike weapon. And then um, again, uh, you're looking at the soft areas of the, of the mm -hmm. potential, especially the nose area because it waters the eyes and it can, it hurts. It um, stuns them. Stuns them. Right. So, yeah. um, that's kind of what, what I'd be focused on. So when I got a, when I, I used to get in fights a lot, I don't know if you guys know that, in high school, and mostly in junior high, I'd always try to hit the nose first because it stuns a dude, man. Just a nice, hard pop yeah. right in the nose. What is the eyes, it yeah. stuns people, so yeah, yeah it's a good target. Um, and, it, and it bleeds easily, and that can kind of shock people also. Yeah. It's blood everywhere, and it's not a serious injury, but it's a lot of blood, right? So, yeah. Um, Psychological. Exactly, exactly. So, I like it. I like it. Yeah, Everything so, you're saying is awesome. So striking, you know, and not just the head, okay? Because again, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to a kind of a, a priority of, of tactics. But um, while I'm talking about striking, if my hands are tied up here and we're this close, I may be just throwing that grinding that knee back and bang if the groin was there, or maybe it's just the thigh, okay? So just and my knees into thighs into the groin if that's viable. My foot, it seems like too close to kick with, but if I'm here and I just stomp into his instep, mm -hmm. or if this, if, this, um, if this foot was back a little bit, so it's gonna depend on where his position is, I may be looking at kick, kicking to his knee, just basically stomping, okay? So I'm bringing my foot up and just stomping out, okay? That may be to disbalance him, you see it brings his leg off the floor. If he doesn't bring his leg off the floor, it might be hyperextending his knee, okay? So I, I may be using my feet, my knees, I've all, I talked about the head, I may be biting, I may bite his air off right here. I may do the Mike Tyson, right? And just, you know, if it's a fight for my life, I may be going to- Do some, what you have to do. Yeah. Um, Not quite to stink pen levels, but close. <laughs> <laughs> I may be going to eye gouge, right? I may mm -hmm. be driving my thumb right into his eye as I'm, doing, as I'm doing this. My elbows are accessible, okay? So my elbows, I may be just bang, coming right up into the face and then, but the, the whole thing is like, whatever I do, I just can't really push control of my gun. <laughs> Big thing that Conor McGregor showed us in his last fight was a shoulder too. Yeah. Like the shoulder to the nose and the mouth will always disarm. If, so if he's right here by my thin, I might be going bang right there with my with my mm. shoulder, just throwing my shoulder right there. So nice. you've got some good up, some good strike options. Um, now, having said that, okay, as a priority, um, I've found that if you get if you if he's off balance and I just put him on the ground real fast, that may be the best. I call the ground the omnipresent impact weapon, okay? If you could hit someone really hard with Mother Earth, it can take the fight out of them. So if I had him off balance, don't worry about striking, take him to the ground. Drive him to the ground. Drive him to the ground and let the ground take the wind out of him. And that may be set you up for a more dominant position to break free of his grip and, and disengage. Can you lock up like you were just a minute ago? Yeah. So he's grabbing the gun. So is it fair to say that he's at a really big disadvantage here because you do have him locked up? Yeah. So he, even if he wants to retreat, 
he may not be able to if you're effective in your grapple. Is that true? Exactly. Yes. So I you may, can tune him up with that. I may lock his arm in there and lock his hand in there. And then um, as we get to this next um, principle, that may start, like as you said, messing up his eye. Because the next principle we're going to look at is, um, uh, uh, again, priority of work. If, if I lock him up and I see that I, I might have a good opportunity, got him off balance, I may be just taking him down hard. If I didn't have him off balance, I may be striking. My whole goal is to get him away from my gun, create distance. Okay, um, but that may be um, more work than it, 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 you know, in, in practice than it is in theory. So, um, so now if I was going to try and, and take him to the ground, a simple principle because I could go through the, the nuances of several techniques. But a, a, a quick principle to learn is aggressive angles and circles. Okay, aggressive angles and circles. Ideally, moving against the natural articulation of the arm. Okay? The arms and the hands articulate best inward. Okay? When you start moving them outward, they stop, the articulation stops and they can be hyper, they can be, um, the joints can be manipulated uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that's going to cause damage. Okay? So the elbows, the wrists even, you know, it's going to get to a point if you keep bending it, it's going to... And again, if I'm moving the other direction, the arms naturally move that way and, and people can start grabbing onto you also. So what I'm trying to say is I want to try and get movement to where I'm manipulating his arm to the outside and bringing it this way as opposed to if he's, if he's holding here and I start spinning like that, now I've just put myself behind, put him behind me and he may start grabbing around my neck or something like that, right? So, Maybe he has a dagger. Yeah, exactly. So this is not the direction I want to move in uh, ideally. I want to move in angles and circles that move against the natural articulation of those joints. So if he was to grab that, that arm there and I was to hold on, maybe that natural, see how the articulation would be this way. So if I pull against his elbow and I make space here, because I can't really move if I don't move my legs. So I just basically do a circle with my feet and angle downward. That may be what I need to get him down. Let go of my gun, let go of my gun. Let go of my gun. And I may just, I may hear start throwing knees. I may start throwing hammer fists down to his head until he's let go of the gun. From here, again, principles. Everything I was looking at was larger joints. When I get, a, if I get to a position where there's some stability, okay, stability of the, of the limb, there's no movement, his hands are not moving, it's stuck on my gun, then I may shift focus from large joints to small joints. And what I mean by that, if he's not letting, letting go, so grab onto my gun, if he's not letting go of my gun, I may look to grab one of his fingers and just, Oh, don't hurt him. Okay. And now he's going to let go of the gun. Yeah. Okay. So I now start moving. It doesn't matter which finger. Okay. I may grab this small finger and just bend and get him away from my gun and then create distance. Okay. Create distance and then always practice drawing your weapon out. Um, if, you, if the weapon for some reason was out of the holster, do a, a malfunction drill and start moving to a safe position. Can you go through that slow motion for the guys? The same thing you just did. The takedown? Yeah. Okay. Just slow motion. Okay, so, um, and I'm going to show you another one here, but just to kind of get the wheels turning, but, so this is what we would call So a you're spinning like outside his... Yeah, so, I'm, again, just, it, when you practice this, just think it through. If I s grab here, and I spin this way, I'm going towards the natural movement of his arm. If I go this way, and I pull just above his elbow, and I angle down, because if I don't angle down, we're just going to go in circles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I've got to angle down, yeah. And from here, if he's not letting go, grab one finger. Go to the digits. And start or wrist. going off that. Yep, and this holster's starting to... Notice his hand was on Enos's elbow the whole time. Yes. So he's really that, locking the him pressure in. pressure was there. So I'm like to that. So that's, I want I you guys to remember this here. right here. I even started putting my body on that. Yes, yeah, so you're really locking that arm down. Yeah. It's a control. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, that's... that's uh, well, nice. Let, let's look at, just to kind of reinforce that principle, because um, there's lots of what ifs, and we're not going to get into all the what ifs. No, we'll here. be here all day. Is, yeah, but let's. And we'll at, still be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so let's look at, and and the most and the what ifs that take the most time to think out. I'll show you a drill that we do, but let's just kind of look at this. So let's say it was the other hand, okay? Which is more likely because most of the population are right-handed, and he's trying to grab my gun. He's probably going to grab it with that hand here. Okay. So again, I'm going to go through the same processes. Get my base. Secure my weapon. Okay. However, I decide to secure that. Now what I'm going to do is use my chest to push against his elbow, and I'm going to go that way. Because again, if I start going the other direction, what's going to happen is I'm um, pulled in, and he's going to be able to maybe use that other hand to, to, to hit me or something. 
So what I do is I go the other way, angle and circle. So one thing that, as you practice this stuff that you'll get used to is, based on where his thumb is, I know where his elbow is. Okay? So that's just kind of something that takes practice. I know that if, I, if his thumb is up, his elbow's there and his arm's gonna bend that way. Okay? If his thumb is down, um, so I'm gonna try and assist it go down, now his elbow's up, which means that's where the manipulation's gonna go, down. Mm -hmm. okay? So he's grabbing onto that. I, could, I secure, and I bring my leg back, I push, and I get him down here. I start looking forward, get it going again. And again, I'm doing this nice and gentle. Ideally, I'm putting his face as hard into the ground as I can. Yeah. Okay? And then I start looking at fingers and, and trying to get him off. If I needed to, I might just bang, field goal, and then create this thing. Field goal. Okay? And again, verbal commands, create distance. What does the tactics tell me to do? Just completely split, get on, get on the phone, call the police, whatever, you know. If I've got family to protect, I'm getting moving between him and them, so on and so forth. Um, so, um, you know, that's, these are very generic positions, what we call cross-hand seam side, because they're the easiest ones to kind of start with, but there's a lot of variables that can creep in. These, these principles, though, are sound. Let me just kind of look at, maybe explore another one. If he grabbed on to a gun like that. Okay. that I was going to ask you about that, coming yeah. up from behind and taking it. Yeah, again, I'm doing the same procedure. He may try to grab it on my neck. So that's, what, that's one of the reasons why I get a good base, okay, and I come through here. Now, what I'm, what I'm going to do is lock his hand in here, and what I'm going to do is spin, okay? So if I just spin slowly and his hand is locked in there, look what happens to his wrist. Okay, he's not going to be able to hold on to that. If I spin aggressive, if I spin slowly, he's going to walk around with me. If I spin slowly, he's just going to walk around. If it's a quick, he let go of the gun, so okay, quickly, aggressively spin, it's going to um, injure his wrist. He's not going to be able to maintain hold. He's going to let go because of that pain. Um, and I spin, push him away, and quick distance. He's going to continue from there. So that's kind of uh, um, the part. Now, I want to illustrate something. These movements can be aggressive and securing a weapon is important. What can often happen is if I'm not being careful, he may break my holster off and take the gun with the holster. And that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Dude, that's good to see. Look at that. Okay, so the plastic there is broken. Yep. So that, that happens. I've seen it in training. Another good data point. Yeah, yeah it, it, so that's why your tactics have got to kind of take into consideration. Um, that's why if I was pushing down that way, that can happen faster depending on what kind of holster you have. But it's just this, plastic. The, the, yeah, it's just plastic. And those, those, um, those uh, weak points there are usually the ones that will break. Okay. Put, you want to put that duty holster on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, OJ's duty rig right here. It's got a steel baton in it, cuffs. Um, I don't have that. Normally I've got magazines here that mm -hmm. conceal this knife. It's the same knife I've got. It's the live version of, of this trainer, so I'll switch them out. Okay. You want to show them that knife real quick? Yeah. They're going to want to know about it. Yeah, so this, this is a, a design. It's got my logo on this side. A co collaboration I did with Bastinali Knives. That's their logo on that side. And it's um, a push dagger that's it's got a grip to, to, to blade angle like a Glock. And it's designed so that if I don't train a lot with a knife, but I just can index that, pull it out, and just start punching, I can still cut with it too. Some people say, oh, it's a push dagger, you can't cut with it. If I, if I cut like that, because of how, this is a little thumb um, index point right there. So if I just go like that, it'll cut deep. Okay, so it'll cut well. It'll obviously, all I need to know is how to punch, and I can be really deadly with this knife. And it's low profile for like a position like this is a duty holster. When I'm bending over and doing things, it just doesn't uh, uh, stick into me like a, a normal fixed blade would. And as you saw, I was carrying one in an appendix carry concealed. Same thing. It's very a fixed blade. For defensive purposes, a fixed blade, when feasible, is going to be your best option. And I say when feasible because sometimes it's just not, and so you've got to find the right folder that is going to be easy to deploy under stress under situations like this. Okay. Does that cut tomatoes good? Cuts them. Uh, hey, people say, hey, that, that's a sink. Well, it's a, it's, I mean, it's I good you're joking. You're stabbing bad guys, but, but yeah, no, the reality is we're going to be cutting tomatoes. Well, and this is the thing. People say, hey, that's a singular and purpose blade. It's actually not. There's even little bits of tape on there. <laughs> you can kind of, uh, you can see You've the, the, the glue. For everything. So 
When I hold it like that and just index the blade, it's actually a good utility knife. Here's my EDC today, boys. And I, I like that that Pair opens out of the holster, out of the holster, out of the pocket. It's fast. Is, it's still a, a folding knife. If it's a folding knife. But I've I, made the determination I don't need a fixed blade today. Yeah. No, today. And, yeah, exactly. And that. And Last time you saw me, what I have? Peacekeeper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the, the thing is, these, uh, if it is a pocket deploy, I mean, if, if it is a folder, it should have, in my opinion, just like that, some Agree. pocket deploy type feature. Yep. Yeah. All right, you're doing great. Okay, great so, information. So yeah, so um, so that's good. We saw that holster failure. Yeah, that's really uh, good. I, I teach people that all the time. I, this like this is a lot stronger holster, and I've done a lot of I've, I've done a lot of uh, courses with this, and it's yet to break. But I have seen some of these points here break on holsters too. These just those thin plastic points. Uh, what to be holster is that? Safari. This is Safariland ALS. Yeah. Okay, I'll put a link below if I can and, find and it. To, Let me grab to Jared's, um To Jared's credit, one of the things I remember him telling me in the academy. When I was going um, going to the in-house academy installer like PD, was he always emphasized make your mistakes in training in those what if scenarios. So when it so actually true. goes live action, you've already run that what if scenario. What if right. this breaks? So this is a perfect example of an equipment failure because some it's it's man-made. It can fail. So just. Just like we're doing now, the what ifs, and it did break. So now what? And so this, and this something perfect. too. I mean, good, uh, good it, point. It did take us a number of repetitions of this drill for, for that actual holster to break. So and you were pulling it up too was, by the muzzle really hard. On it. So yeah. that uh, keep in mind if you are training these drills um, with a holster uh, that you actually use, you might think about having a different one to train with versus one that you actually carry because you are actually stressing those points, and it might break easier. In an, in an actual defensive situation Good if point. you've been practicing with it. Okay. So. Uh, when you carry though, you carry concealed, right? Yes. Are you going inside the waistband? Yes. Are you carrying a retention style holster? I bet you ain't. No. because uh, It I, doesn't, it's too big, right? Too bulky? It, it, yeah, I mean, con concealment, I mean, I'm talking real concealment, not like it's under a shirt, but everyone knows you got a gun, okay? Uh, real concealment is a good level of retention. Agree. And so if they, people don't know I've got a gun, they're not gonna reach for my gun, okay? Um, and then just some good friction on top of that is usually um, sufficient. So you've got you know a couple of a couple of levels of and all the fr friction really does is just if I'm running or something, it's just not going to come flying out of the yeah. holster. Yeah. So. Yeah. Nice. So that have you seen that fail lately though that particular holster? No, no, I have seen a, I have actually seen in a training uh, event. I've seen a couple of Safari Land holsters break plastic yeah. Safari Lands. Um, but you know, when I, having said that, I've, I've trained. In, in weapon retention t tactics, I've trained hundreds, if not thousands, of officers, and almost all of them have some kind of a plastic. No one uses leather holsters anymore, like just completely leather, mm. um, and uh, maybe like a facade of leather basket weave or something. But um, for the amount of holsters I've seen doing these drills and the amount that, I, uh, that break, it's not a lot, but it's it's a probability. It's, it exists. Okay. Nice. Uh, it probability exists. Um, so, uh, you know, um, again, one the, kind of the, I think one of the Without kind of getting real technique heavy and, and showing a whole bunch of stuff, one of the things that I like to um, to do is uh, in a tr basically a, a small drill, and you only need two people to do it. And it's it's a I call it an, an OODA loop drill. Okay, and um, if you're not familiar with that term, it basically observe, means observe, orient, decide, decide, and act. Exactly, exactly. So I'm just looking for training myself to uh, quickly observe and orientate myself to something that's happening, and then make a decision and act on it in a training environment, right? So um, we, we start with a partner, we start um, doing a drill where I'll, the, uh, the, the person that's training the retention will close their eyes and the partner is just going to approach in some random angle position and he's going to latch onto me and grab my gun. And then from there I'm going to walk through my steps, okay? Get my base, protect my weapon, look at my angles, look at my strikes, what can I do to get this guy off my gun and start walking. And the more of those you do, the more you're going to be able to adapt and, and process your movement. So for example, I might be here, I've got my eyes closed. Now just don't do any running tackles on your partner when you do this because it can be quite dangerous. So there, okay, so he came in from a frontal kind of almost a tackle type position and this proximity is very realistic. It's like a clinch distance, right? So he's kind of coming here. So what do I do? I secure and I get my, my gun under control. Okay? Now what I would do right now, after I've done that, I'll be giving verbal commands, let go of my, my gun, let go of my gun, and then I'd be looking to use my knife to get into areas. I can't get high into the face area, but jabbing right into the femoral, into the groin is probably gonna grab his attention. Okay, let go of my gun, let go of my gun. It's cutting here, okay, until, and then I might look at, if he's still holding on after I've done a couple of those cuts, I might look at cutting here, 
Okay, cut into the arm to break his grip, and then just a quick angle in the circle is going to get him off. Right on. So that that may be that with a, in this setup here, I'd be looking to secure and transition. Okay. Now let's look at another. Um, to do another repetition. It was one more repetition for the sake of argument. So, okay, so I'm closing my eyes. Okay. Again, so this is the position. He's behind. I've grabbed I, this holster. I like this position here. Okay. I, I might bang hit him right in the groin. Boom, right there, based on where he is. And then I'm going to do a quick spin. I'm going to do it slow for training because this will hurt his wrist. But if I spin out this way, there's no way he's going to keep a hold of that. Okay. If it's, just, if it's a quick dynamic spin. If it's slow, he's going to follow me and go with the force, so on and so forth. If it's a quick dynamic spin, especially after that, bang, and then spin out. And then I'm looking to transition. Move, create distance, give commands, so on and so forth. Okay, let's say you went to that, you drew your weapon, and you've issued a command. Get on the ground, get on the ground, do he, it now. He doesn't have a gun, he's coming to you. What do you do now? He's demonstrated intent. What would I do right now? Yes, Likely. as a civilian. As a, okay. That's a hard question. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean to paint you into I'm a corner here. I like batons, I got, <laughs> I got pepper spray, I got So you went to less than lethal, if, if you can. If I, if I felt And there's like, a lot of variables. I know. Enos. So, because I know him, I probably would stay at lethal. Because <laughs> he'll take you down to stay your throat. This dude is bad. Because I'm not looking for a fighting chance. I'm looking to survive. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not. I'm not looking for an even fight here. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for what's going to help me survive. Okay. Because it's, it's, we're talking about life or death here. So, um, in some another situation, I might be transitioning to a less lethal option. So that's. I tell my guys, the civilians, if you can, run away. Absolutely. Get out of there. Absolutely. It's going to be the cheapest. You don't have any legal problems that way. Just leave. And if he pursues you and you don't have options, then you may have to go somewhere else. That's my the first thing stay, I always... Stay away from problems. Exactly. I always tell people the fight that you will always survive is the one that you've been able to avoid and or get away from. Okay, so, get away. Stay away. Exactly. So, um, so, yeah, if that's a feasible option, absolutely. For law enforcement, it's not a feasible option. And for some, mm -hmm. some civilian situations, it might not be also. Meaning... Um, I'm I'm in a I'm in a plane. Where do I run away to? You know. Yeah. Um, or or you have an injury. I have an injury. Like my knee is not good these days. So yeah. So I can't I can really run, out running do someone that. might not be viable. Um, environmental factors, but also uh, if I'm out with my family and I run away and say, "You guys are on your own," you know, <laughs> that might not be a viable. I may have a, no. a duty to protect someone I'm with, and so I have to stay in and, and engage that that situation. So, um, yeah, just kind of think through that. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff, Jared. So it's really kind of like shallow. Like I said, an actual physical training course would take a minimum of one full day. And a lot of times, I have to go, because we haven't even addressed, what, addressed the ground variables. Um, so if you're getting to all more of the what ifs, then it's actually more of like a two day training. Uh, We're already at 36 minutes. Yeah. Or yeah. thereabouts. Yeah. So. Um, so let's go over your basics again and remind them. Yeah. And so, before we close the video, slow motion so they can really drill it in and remember. Yeah, so just for, again, first defense, situational awareness, your final defense is a good holster. Okay, so those two things. Situational awareness, when you're carrying a firearm, and a good holster is your last line of defense. And sometimes your first line of defense is someone just trying to snatch a gun from behind or something. Right. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> the, the processes, again, we'll just kind of walk through them. Just practice your first natural reaction when someone's grabbing onto the, onto the gun should be get a base, secure your weapon, Okay, let me stop you right there. One. Get a base. Notice how his legs are apart, so he's not going to get pushed over and end up on the ground. Go, Jared. Okay. Now from here, I'm pushing down into my hip and on an angle. I don't want to push straight down because we saw what can happen. Holsters can break, right? So I'm pushing into my hip on an angle. Or I'm coming underneath and pulling up to lock his hand. Okay. okay. From here, I may strike, but if I felt him off balance, I may just try and take him and hit him with the ground. Okay. But if I... I, and again, I'm not even addressing the we the transition of weapons. Okay? We don't so, have to. So I, I may strike, bang, right? And maybe that sends his leg back like it did there. Bang, and then immediately I start pulling down. Circles and angles. Angles and circles. If you don't train often, experiment. Okay, so which way was that again? So, well, see, right. he's grabbing there. If I turn this way, I just put him behind me. His arm's yeah. bending naturally, and, and that's not going to work. If I go this way, I'm going against that natural articulation so just kind of walk it through and when he's talking about angles he's talking about driving to the ground yeah yeah, yeah. exactly and, and now if there was if we were right here and let's say see kind of look that steel post i have exactly. that's going to be coming into play here and in a minute going like that back, right <laughs> and hitting him into the wall or into he just liked that one yeah we actually got a laugh i, out would, of I was thinking i would put my foot on there and <laughs> 
Yeah. But you're eating it. So do some yeah. parkour. That's what I would do. He's not a mere mortal like the rest of us, but um, but yeah, I mean, you know, throw him down a flight of stairs, throw him off a balcony, you know. Yeah. Whatever. It's just the, the environment may assist in that, but if not, just try to get down, throw okay. him everyone with the ground. Yeah. Okay. And um, again, if that may not work, my if, but I, another thing to think of too is again, if it's not working, strikes, right? We talked about that. Looking at, just kind of play, play, play with this a little bit. Don't, don't need to memorize a whole bunch of cool techniques. If he's grabbing on here with a partner, just kind of think through, okay, what, what weapons do I have? I got my feet, I got my knees. I Your got breath. My clothes, I got my, my breath, okay, yep. my, my ugly face, okay? Yep. Um, I, I got, uh, you know, head butts, I've got, you know, biting, eye gouging, I've got little things that can, they might not be fight finishes, they're definitely distractions, okay? They can gotcha. set up the takedown that I'm looking for. Um, and so that, and then also we talked about small joint manipulation. Even if I haven't got him to the ground, his hand is not moving. I'm not a big, uh, so, so when it's here, I may be looking to peel off one of those fingers and just get him off the gun. Bang, hit with the head and create distance. Yeah. You could snap that finger pretty quick, couldn't you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just a quick snap, it's boom. Good, yeah, it's, a it's out of joint at the minimum. If I get my whole hand working on one finger, mm. oh yeah. And, and I, being a, playing a bad guy in scenarios, um, force on force scenarios with new, new police officers going through training, I almost had my finger broken. I was trying to take the gun off of a, of a recruit and he went to the small joint technique. Mm. And, and I actually had to yell at him, end exercise, end exercise, because yeah. he almost broke my finger. But I, I was proud of him because hey, in training, and I felt that it worked on my side. I, I can yeah. see the technique works. So, um, but it's just, it can break that finger real, real. So, moving to small joints. I'm not a big fan of small joint manipulation when things are moving. If he's trying to manipulate my wrist, then I'm doing this kind of a thing. He's not gonna get a hold of my wrist. I'm right. gonna be, you know. But if my hand is stable or his hand is stable, now I can go for those small joints. It's in joints. the toolkit. Exactly. Understand it, understand the principles, know the when and the where. All right, we're wrapping it up. Uh, Jared travels the world teaching law enforcement and military about the techniques you see. Yeah. Uh, and a lot more. We're not even covering what he teaches them. All kinds of uh, force on force, grappling techniques, gun use, knife use, all that. Yeah. That's what he does for a living. Yeah. So does Enos. Yeah, well, when I'm not trained for an Ironman, I'm actually teaching here as well Mondays and Wednesdays. And where is here? We are at Jim Jones, okay, Jim Jones in Salt Lake City, Utah, and Jim Jones is a company that we've gotten involved with. It's a great um, fitness first kind of a facility, but fitness for um, protection, for self-preservation, you know, um, whether you're a civilian, and they've trained up to Tier 1 Special Operations units here, so um, great company. So come on down to Jim Jones. Uh, Jared may be here. Say hello. I will be. Throw some yeah. iron around. And, and go to my website too, jaredwehungy.com. Jaredwehungy.com, gotcha. And uh, they got plenty of iron here for you. Yep. Stay in shape for what's coming. Absolutely. If you can yep. stay in shape, do it. If you have the health, it's, it's job all. one. And I said that in Tactically Squared Away. Yeah. Uh, these guys are models. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Till the next Bye. episode, Nothing Fancy Project with the boys.